You are listening to Counter Esperanto Podcast. Tangents about Twin Peaks with Carl Eckler and Jubal Brousseau from the Pseudo Spaces Network. Greetings, everybody. My name is Jubal Brousseau, and I'm here with uh, my oldest friend in the world, Carl Eckler. Hi, Carl. Hi, Jubal. Yeah, let's actually give a little bit of a background. I live in, currently live in Portland, Oregon, and I uh, do sound recording, uh, videography. I'm in school for film, and uh, this is the first episode of an as-yet-untitled podcast. We just decided to, we've had so many ideas jumping around, we just decided to jump right into it. Uh, what's your background, Carl? Well, I'm overeducated and underemployed, so I'm pretty much like most people in America right now. Also, I have a degree in library science, which proves that I'm very studious and not too good on the forecasting. But you're good with uh, with historical details, and that's uh, that's important for what we're talking about here. We we actually have had a uh, uh, a couple false starts already uh, doing uh, trying to create some podcasts about uh, weird fiction, like uh, you know Lovecraft, you know H.P. Lovecraft, of course, but also. Uh, people that influenced him and uh, and people that we read, uh, you know, that are current. And, uh, that, you know, the, we ended up having some false starts there. And then we've had some, you know, other ideas. But with uh, Twin Peaks uh, coming coming back, I guess, next spring, and Mark Frost's uh, new Twin Peaks book that came out a few weeks ago, uh, we thought this would be a good way to inaugurate a new podcast that isn't necessarily going to be specifically about Twin Peaks, although I, I imagine that we'll have a few episodes uh at least between now and then. We'll see how it goes. But we also wanted to talk about not only weird fiction, and we'll get into what that, what that, what that entails, but also weird history. Uh, so it just, you know, it, this is sort of like a, uh, an umbrella podcast for a lot of the things that we love. Uh, Carl and I go back many years. We were high school in high school together in the, what, like 22 years ago did we meet? or twenty? No, we probably met about 24 or 25 years ago. Well, let's not think about the years. After all, it's not the years; it's the mileage. <laughs> but uh, but we are, uh, you know, we're definitely obsessive about a lot of uh, weird topics, and uh, and we both discovered Twin Peaks around the same time. Uh, in the we discovered Twin Peaks in the same time and space. Yes, yes, we mo- we had moved to Portland, Oregon, from uh, Colville, Washington. And that has some significance that we'll get into later. But uh, we discovered Twin Peaks uh, on VHS. Yes, we were aware of it when it was on, but we were a little bit young. Uh, I think I I tried watching it uh, an episode and was lost. You know, it was you know part way through the first season, I guess. Um, But we both discovered it on VHS in the mid '90s and plowed through all of the episodes and the movie quite rapidly. Yeah, prior to getting to watch the show on VHS I have scraggly memories of watching a show on television and then I later realized that it was Shelley Johnson that was putting the bloody shirt into the outdoor washing machine (laughs) and then my parents told me to go to bed (laughs) because I was 14 and they were crazy I think at my first encounter with Twin Peaks was seeing, it might have been in TV Guide, uh, a picture of the giant. So that must have been, se- the, that was the second season then, because probably right after the premiere when it was at the height of its uh, of its popularity or at least notoriety. And uh, I, remember, I remember thinking that was such a strange image, this image of the d- giant down from what ended up being Agent Cooper's perspective on him. Uh, and it made me want to see the series, but I never got around to it until I was out of high school. I think it was a, it was summer of '94, I believe, is when we watched it. But uh, so there are a lot of podcasts about Twin Peaks right now. Some of them are dormant because they were recap podcasts that have long since gotten past that part of it. So they so they are now lying dormant. You know, there, there are definitely a lot of active podcasts. You know, there, you know, many of whom have already been digging into the the book, but. Let's talk about kind of what we're uh, our approach here, because we we kind of wanted to work backwards, which is sort of fitting for this material. Yeah, especially because of how the book is structured, I thought it would be really interesting just to kind of tear right into the mystery. I think um, the mystery as opposed to the secret. Right. Do we want to just give our initial 
uh, reactions to the book first. So yes, and uh, and of course it, it, it probably goes without saying, but we're going to say it anyway that this is uh, definitely a spoiler cast. It's going to assume that you ha- that any listener has uh, encountered uh, or you know and gone through this material before, has seen the series and the film, and um, so yeah, let's get into it. Um, All right, if you are a Twin Peaks fan and you've not purchased and read or listened to since it's an audiobook as well this book go buy the book yeah the physical book um well that's the one i've got i haven't listened to the audiobook yet ah. i understand that it's amazing i haven't listened to it mm-hmm. yet yeah i i've started it i haven't gotten all the way through it but i, I kind of think that it, you know it, there it's two completely different experiences more so than your average uh audiobook versus the text because uh the, the physical book, you know, since it's in the form of a dossier, it involves a lot of physical documents. And I think that a lot of the mysteries uh, that are in the book are not going to be something that you would be privy to if you were just listening. Um, part of that, of course, is like the uh, typographical uh, quirks and, uh, and there's a, you know, a kind of a now famous uh, stamp on a uh, on a postcard <laughs> that is impossible according to the timeline it's little details like that that you would miss in the audiobook but at the very least the audiobook especially if you have a free credit on audible uh it's definitely a, a no-brainer if you like twin peaks uh and you know i i think the, the book by and large has been well received it's uh uh there's been a few people that, are, that i'm seeing that have been uh they're disappointed i guess they're expecting uh what the what was originally uh this book was originally supposed to catch you up on what was going on in the last 25 years with these characters. But I think it makes a lot more sense that, that he pivoted and went more with the distant history. Uh, I agree. Yeah. Because, uh, the right now, the great mystery is that 25 year gap and right. You know, I still want the mystery, uh, until we get full on, Lynchy and Twin Peaks that um, you know has been turned over and fully realized inside Lynch's magnificent brain for the last quarter century. Yes. What is particularly promising is that Lynch and Frost have been talking about Twin Peaks for the past twenty five years before they decided to finally, you know, pull the trigger and and make a comeback with it. Uh, you know, so they have, uh, I, you know, even though the Frost says that, uh, you know, Lynch has had no hand in this book, um, it doesn't mean that they haven't sort of conferred on what has happened. You know, they haven't had, you know, they, I'm sure that there isn't anything that's wildly outside of anything Lynch is doing, or that is to say it won't interfere. Well, isn't it true that Frost wrote the series um, and Lynch is directing it? Yes. Not that that's going to be a firm sort of um, advertising editorial wall of China thing. Right. Well, and what that, I I mean, the final, they say that the final draft of the script is uh, is when the film is edited. (laughs) And uh, that is, there's a lot that can happen between uh, Frist, Frist, Frost's typewriter uh, or computer and uh, and what we're going to see on Showtime next spring, and uh, and Lynch is pretty famous for uh, making wild revisions or even throwing whole chunks of things out, usually for the better, you know, uh, and you know. But I think that the that the underlying you know structure is going to be is going to be there, and uh, so I you know that and then by the underlying structure, I mean what they have come up with together. But as far as like what we actually see, you know. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, but since Frost it wrote, you know, the rough, rough draft of the film, movie, TV, multimedia experience, whatever the hell we're going to end up calling it, mm-hmm. he knows approximately where the show's going to go to. Yes. So he could make a background that makes some sort of elementary sense. Yes, and and we listened to uh, uh, the new. Uh, Twin Peaks unwrapped today. Uh, that were where they finally kind of went into the details with Joe Joe Bacco, uh, you know, just kind of like their their take on it. And uh, they talked about how uh, you know, in a way, this is Frost's Firewalk with me. 
even though he wanted to go forward back in the 90s when it, when the show was over he wanted to make films that uh, that took the series from the point that it was left and uh, and they you know had kind of a big uh I don't know if falling out is the word, but he definitely uh, did not approve of the idea of making a prequel. And in this case, he is going backwards. And I think a lot of that might have to do, you know, so he himself is kind of doing the same thing, except he's going very far into the distant past. (laughs) And Lynch, of course, is having to move into the future. So stuff is weird, Yeah, I think is about what we can get from that. Um so why don't we just do a real quick um, overview and rea- and generalized reaction to the book and then get to the meat and potatoes, which is the weird stuff, the inconsistencies, the secrets, the lies, and all the other interesting stuff. Okay. Uh, you go first. All right. Well, in form, it is hardback book with an, an annoying dust cover. Yeah. Mine was trashed when I got it. <laughs> yeah. The dust um, cover. Mine was merely bent. <laughs> um, it is nine and one quarters inches tall and <laughs> seven and three quarters inches wide. No other podcasts are going into this kind of detail, folks. 362-ish pages long and... It is totally beautiful. It starts off, chronologically speaking, in the year... 1805, looks like. Yeah, 20th September, 1805, uh, with an excerpt from the expedition journals of William Clark and Meriwether Lewis, September 20th, 1805. From there, it traces what is as far as I can determine, an actually blank period of time in the Lewis and Clark Corps of Discovery journals. This particular um, excerpt is not in the public domain. Well, you know, it is a creation of Frost. Mm -hmm. And most of the historical bits and pieces in here are creations of Frost. However, they fit very, very well into the established consensual reality timeline of the United States that we know. Yes. There is a several gaps in the core of discovery that are missing time because a number of the original uh, diaries and journals were lost on account of the fact that Meriwether Lewis had a rather mysterious death, which the book also goes into. So it'd be safe to say that he's kind of taking actual uh, events that possibly have some mystery around them and and linking them, just by virtue of their presence in this dossier, linking them to the Twin Peaks mythology. I'd say he's kind of ransacking through the elliptonic and conspiratorial history of America and linking it to the Twin Peaks mythos. Because after the information on Meriwether Lewis's um, autopsy and conjectures as to the method of his death, we jump forward in time to the story of Chief In Mut Tu Ya Lat Lat, better known to white history as Chief Joseph of the Nez Pierce. Uh, this is in the summer of 1877, and it tells a rather interesting story about the Sky People and what may or may not be Leo Johnson's great, great, great something granddad. We then leave Chief Joseph and have an interesting encounter at Owl Cave. And then we start the Town of Twin Peaks section where we're introduced to Douglas Milford. And from there, we enter into a shadowy world of government conspiracies, unidentified flying objects, and eventually round our way back to the Town of Twin Peaks through Agent Cooper, and Major Garland Briggs. At that point, the journal pretty much ends probably a few hours after the original series does, and we are finally given the reveal that the person doing the annotation of the dossier is someone we'd never heard of, Tamara Preston, and the 
incredibly revealing reveal that the person actually doing the archiving, the archivist, is Major Garland Briggs. Yes. And uh, it, you, you get this sense also that it was uh, that that Douglas Milford himself uh, um, might have compiled or at least uh, accessed a lot of these documents uh, and then or the, and then he entrusted them to Briggs. That's certainly what we're led to believe. And led to believe may or may not be an important part of the enjoyment of this particular piece of media. A big part of this book is Frost's interest in the distinction between secrets and mysteries. Um, would you like to comment on that, perhaps? Yes. Uh, um, he, At some point in the novel, he talks about how, uh, or the archivist does, I suppose, uh, you know, the, the difference between a secret, which is information that is held um, by humans. It's a human um, device in order to maintain power or to or, or a system of control, whereas a mystery is outside of of human understanding. Uh, it is something that is inherent uh, to the world that doesn't require human understanding or presence. It is it is something that is ineffable and exists outside of human systems of control. Correct. Yeah, and I definitely agree with that. So reactions. Um, I freaking love the book. And then I realized that there were some strange inconsistencies. And then I loved the book even more. How did you feel about that? Well, I made the mistake of sort of staying on Twitter and starting to see that people were getting really irritated with the inconsistencies, which sort of made me look for them harder. But ultimately, I came to a sense of peace about it because I feel that it was obviously very intentional. Uh, there, there are some, you know, uh, things that are so wrong uh, at least as far as like what Twin Peaks uh, fans are, you know, remember from the series that it had to be on purpose. And so it just became mysterious, you know. And so I, I, ultimately, I really enjoyed the book and I feel that it it, uh, it added some context to the history of characters that we, you know, that we knew and loved, particularly uh, Dr. Jacoby. I liked uh, the material um even though there are some obviously, you know, again, glaring inconsistencies in some of his details, uh, he uh, is a lot more of a, I don't know, kind of a cool guy. I thought of him, you know, he, he kind of comes across as a weird pervert in the series. <laughs> he does give off that creepy uncle vibe yeah. frequently. Yeah. And knowing that he wasn't wearing the red and blue glasses just to be weird, but that he actually had a possibly pseudoscientific, but a reason behind it. Mm -hmm. That was interesting. That right. said, um, and now we're going to have to move a little bit deeper into the weeds mm -hmm. and investigate some of the inconsistencies. Yeah, um, and this is going to be by no means uh, comprehensive. We have some, you know, some notes that we're going off of, but uh, largely we're riffing on this right now. Yes, uh, riffing with the understanding that I have, for separate reasons, spent the last six months marinating in conspiracy, electronic, and high weirdness podcasts. Yeah, there's some synchronicity here. Actually, we looked at this book, and uh, you know, we won't go too much into details, but uh, we, there it was. It's really interesting that uh, Frost took this approach, considering what Carl and I had been discussing uh, for various projects that we have in mind. But go ahead. Um. I was surprised to see Fear and Loathing on the Campaign Trail 72 as Hawk's favorite book because it's both very political and very acid heady. Mm -hmm. But well, who knows what his, who knows what his history is? <laughs> well, that's true, and mm -hmm. one of the one of the possibilities for why his account of Ed, Big Ed and Norma's, uh, Norma and Nadine's romance being weird is it could be that uh, Hawk has some acid damage or some PTSD or uh, some concussion injuries from the war uh, that we don't know about. Yeah. Uh, so that's one possibility. The other... Th oh, Another bit of typography, which I just now 
picked up on is the typography for his account of um yeah the ballad of big ed and norma and nadine this it, it looks like it's been offset printed and i just don't see that happening because it's a story of very very personal stuff of people that he considers friends and why would you ever want more than one copy of this i mean mm. Just think what would happen if Nadine got a hold of it, for fuck's sake. So you know, wouldn't be selling this at the local um, bookstore. It wouldn't be circulated in a local magazine. It, it should be, you know, typed up on a computer or typewriter and filed at the bookhouse, sure. But otherwise, not. Yeah. And yet, it looks like it's been offset printed. Hmm. Um, or it's been done with a uh, desktop publisher. We don't know exactly when this was. I have this feeling that this was written maybe a couple of years before the events of the series. Um, my under, I expected that it was written in 1987. Yeah. Uh, because they have a picture of Tommy Hill circa 1987, right before. Yeah. But one thing I noticed that people are picking up on is the... Uh, it's like the biggest sort of seething pit of inconsistencies in the book is this document and mm-hmm. the omission of Annie, the uh, the um, Vivian, the mother uh, Norma's mother is completely different. Mm-hmm. And I want to posit that this might be a result of whatever Annie went through in the Black Lodge. The, the I fact agree. That, the fact that she, we don't see her perspective. We only see how she appears for uh, Cooper. And as far, and for all we know, her uh, appearance, you know, in that final episode of Twin Peaks, that her appearance is simply just a reflection of part of himself. Like, like in a, when, when you see somebody in a dream, that is, a, uh, that's you, you know, that you're interacting with. So mm-hmm. we see Annie go in uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, we see her laying on the ground afterwards, and then we see her in the hospital in the outtakes of Fire Walk With Me, but otherwise we have no idea what she went through. Yeah. And uh, and I want to posit the idea that possibly what whatever happened to her in there, because uh, she wouldn't, like, this. all of this stuff was never on her radar. She doesn't strike me as a mystical person. <laughs> you know, no... no uh, uh, you know, she, she doesn't strike me as dumb either, but I don't think that this was the kind of thing that, you know, this was not, you know, on her mind at all. And whatever she went through possibly retroactively erased her from this, you know, the timeline that we know of. That's possible. Um, to counter your assertion that she's non-mystical, however, she did spend five years in a clustered, silent nunnery. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a good point. That she's uh, she's religious. She was praying, um, you know, uh, when she when she was uh, taken to the by Wendy Merle to the Circle of Sycamores. Uh, so there there is this possibility that uh, that you know she brought her faith in there, and you know perhaps it wasn't enough, or but we we have no idea. It could have been you know maybe she just com- willed herself into a different universe. We do know in Firewalk with me that she sits up and tells Laura, you know, she appears to Laura, but she also sat up in the hospital bed and said, you know, uh, the good Dale is in the lodge, write it in your diary. So she has insight into what happened to Cooper. Correct. In fact, she has more insight than anyone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I agree with that too. Um, so, and actually I have a slightly different solution to the, um, the one eye. Okay. Oh, hey, I just realized that that's a funny kind of typographic joke. Hmm. It, the, it's the one or the eye for the one. Oh, so like, it's one eye. Like the, Jack with one eye, Nadine Ill- with one eye. The Illuminati. Oh. <laughs> I, actually, I wasn't thinking of that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But let's talk about, yeah, let's talk about some of the typography. Uh, so as many people have pointed out, uh, the one and the I in a lot of these documents have been 
have been switched. The the idea that the 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 letter I is being used in place of a one. So give us some background of uh, why that might be. Besides that, all the documents are forged. <laughs> If you've read the book or you've been paying attention to some of the discussions about it, you probably know that the archivist uses a capital I instead of the number one to indicate the numeral one. So instead of 1989, it will be I-989. Why is this? Well, it's kind of an interesting question, especially if you're an obsessive typewriter geek like I am. Because we assume that the archivist is Major Briggs, and because Major Briggs shows us a picture of his typewriter, the first instinct was to assume that the one key was broken. We can clearly tell that that's not true. The next thing to, uh, we assumed was, for some other reason, he might be using an I instead of a one. And that makes a good deal of sense, because early typewriters did not have a one key. Instead, one would use a lowercase l in order to indicate the one numeral. Even earlier typewriters had no lower cases. And in that system, if one was a uh, typist on such a machine that had no lower cases, one would use an i instead of a one, because the one also would not appear. So it could simply be that uh, the archivist learned to type on a very old machine that um, did not use a one. And then later on, they picked up the machine that Major Briggs gave us a picture of. On page 344, you'll see a copy of, as Major Briggs puts it, my faithful Corona. That's the typewriter which we assume that he is writing all the notes for the archivist in this book. And that makes this typewriter a subject of uh, some inquiries. I mean, number one, why the hell did he take a picture of his typewriter and stick it in the archive? And on top of that, as far as I can tell, this typewriter can't exist. I could be wrong. I'm not a typewriter um, expert by any means, but using the Google, I could not find any example of a Corona typewriter in the German Quartzy key layout. You can tell that on the top row of letter keys, the the keys begin Q-W-E-R-T-Z, as opposed to Q-W-E-R-T-Y. And there's a couple of extra letters with umlauts on the right-hand side, and the shift keys are in German. Also, on the 3 and 5 keys, there's an interesting symbol that I've never seen before. It could be a mark symbol, but I can't be certain. I'm mostly able to place the time frame of the typewriter's manufacturer to either right before or during World War II, and that could explain the weird layout of the typewriter, because during World War II, no typewriter manufacturer sold typewriters to your average Joe. Instead, the government needed a lot of typewriters to keep everything straight. So every American typewriter company had one client during the war, the government. So it could be that this uh, typewriter was the result of a specialized uh, product line made for typing up German correspondence or making disinformation or use in intelligence work. One thing that I did find interesting was that if it was made pre-war, and if it was to be used for intelligence work, it lacks the rune symbol. On a lot of German typewriters of that period, they would have the SS double lightning mark mm -hmm. um, as a shift option above either the 3 or the 5. The same place where that mark I can't identify is on Major Briggs's typewriter. That's interesting. I have no freaking clue what it means, but interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, it's it seems like the the I and one thing might be a red herring, but uh, one thing that I'm just kind of uh, you see that used in some of the documents that supposedly he's collecting. So uh, some people are having this idea that those are forgeries, but that's not necessarily the case because, as you said, a lot of old t 
typewriters existed, you know, possibly around the times that these documents were made, where that would have been a uh, a practice, you know. So it wouldn't necessarily have come from this typewriter or from his typewriter. It, it still would have been a weird quirk by the time that he bought that Buick Roadmaster, that's for sure, by 1947. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, that would be kind of odd. Um, but not entirely unknown. So that's a possibility, but to me, it's too weird. My understanding is that that is, in fact, significant in-world. Yes. And I know you've mentioned several times to me before that the one character we have seen in Twin Peaks that is capable of time travel, Annie, is Mm -hmm. apparently nowhere in the book. And is her actress, as far as we know, is not cast for the 2017 series. Correct. Well, and I, and recently at one of his readings, somebody asked, you know, when, it, when he did a Q&A, somebody asked Frost, how's Annie? <laughs> and Frost said, <laughs> Frost said, patience. Hmm. So uh, that indicates that, uh, um, you know, We'll find out. All will be, yeah, either all will be clear or there will be something that complicates everything further. Or all will be revealed in time, which is also said, which I take as a dead giveaway that the reason this particular collection of documents exists at all is as an artifact of time travel. I believe, as I believe you do, that Mm -hmm. somehow. Annie Blackburn went back through time and changed things and has either altered things so that this collection of documents exists in this world or the explanation I actually like better is that this is a collection of documents from another world or another timeline that is collapsed in our, on our own and no longer exists, leaving only certain artifacts like this particular dossier still extant from that other <laughs> from that other yeah. place yeah i believe the real meaning of it doesn't have anything to do with the typewriter i think it's an indicator that these documents are from another place i mean it's an eye which to me screams iteration mm-hmm. this was Another go around, another iteration. It's also a Roman numeral one, so it's maybe the first go around or the second. Yeah, it'd be the first. It seems like it's an indicator that perhaps in this alternate timeline, for whatever reason, one of the things that was different, or in some weird timey wimey wibbly wobbly sense, what changed was the convention of how to type a one on a typewriter that has no one key. And that functions as an indicator as to which documents come from there and which come from right. our version or the current Twin Peaks version of how things actually, quote-unquote, happened. That's a good point. And, uh, I mean, I, I don't know to what extent you have investigated this, but I'm sure that's something that will be coming out of it's not already out there, which is, you know, wh- exactly which documents that aren't the archivist's writing um, uses that convention and what they say. Like, just, if you isolated those things, what kind of patterns would emerge? Well, um, I have not had a chance to go through all of it, but I know a number of the typewritten documents use a regular one. For example, the memorandum by the FBI agents reporting on the Kenneth Arnold incident on 12 July 1947. Their typewriter has a one as separate from a lowercase i and they use it. On 12 July 1947, those are ones, not lowercase l's. They look different. I believe most of the Project Blue Book stuff is actually standard ones, but I would have to go through and reread it with a memo book next to me in order to um, figure that out. Right, because the uh, the the receipt for Douglas's Buick uses the eyes. The receipt is one of the 
big ones that doesn't follow the pattern of the archivist using eyes for ones, whereas everybody else uses ones like sane people. Um, <laughs> uh, on the other theory that everything with a eye for a one is a forgery, well, that could well be a forgery. But frankly, it's one of those weird things like, why the hell is Douglas Milford's receipt from a car he bought in 1947 actually in the book to begin with? Well, yeah, and uh, not only that, but it seems like the whole purpose of that is that it is a device to sort of show that he's kind of in the background of things when he's not like literally communicating with, you know, whoever's writing the document. You know, it's like there's I think there was something saying that he shows up, uh, you know, that, that there was this Buick outside, a black Buick outside. Mm -hmm. right? And so you get, OK, so that's it could be him. And, you know, and Tamara Preston's. Uh, annotation would uh, maybe point that out. But otherwise, aside from sort of uh, showing this thread of, of Douglas Milford's presence throughout these events, there doesn't seem to be any purpose to that. Yeah. And that's and why that's what flies in the face of the idea that anything with an eye is a forgery. Yeah. Why would you bother forging something so pointless? Joel said in the Twin Peaks Unwrapped podcast that he, he finds it odd that if this isn't a situation of, a, of time being changed, you know, of history being altered, that it would still come together in the same result. And, and, and that is a good point. Uh, um, but as Rip Hunter says in Legends of Tomorrow, time wants to happen. It depends yeah. on how plastic your definition of time is for this particular universe. Because things have basically, you know, if, the, if this is true, like if this is essentially a different timeline, we don't know what else has been changed. And the events of the last episode of the series being sort of the last, you know, point of reference for where things ended up, except for a couple brief things in this book. We have no idea how things have been changed. And it could very well be that when we watch season three, there will, there will be similar gaps. One of my ideas about about this is that not only is this sort of like uh, Frost's fire walk with me, these inconsistencies are sort of like his equivalent to Lynch's paradoxes, like the uh, the Fred and Pete identity switch in Lost Highway. There mm. are gaps and things, you know, that that are that are occurring that don't make any logical sense. Somebody in the uh, Red Room podcast said that this is like a trap for Twin Peaks fans or the Twin Peaks know it alls. <laughs> well. I believe they're probably right about that, but it's a trap that we want to be in because part of the fun of the show is weighing the different possibilities and mm. trying to come to a better understanding of what it could mean, even though at a certain point you give up and decide which interpretation you want to like best at whatever time you want to like it. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's actually kind of an interesting point is that the two creators of the show, uh, Lynch, you know, would represent intuition and Frost could represent logic, which is, you know, as we see in the, the Jacoby material, you have the red and blue. One, you know, the red suppresses the intuition and the blue suppresses the logic. Mm -hmm. I think it's in one of the early documents. I think it was the, is it Jefferson's letter or, he, or diary, I guess, where he's talking about uh, the gibberish that he was getting from Lewis, talking about the secret hidden in the color red. Yeah. And uh, so we're looking at, uh, you know, obviously there's the red room. There's the blue rose. Uh, Lynch was famously very careful about what, you know, uh, about how much and what uh, blue and what could be blue on the set of the series, you know, and and, uh, and in his other films, too, color is very important, you know, and, and meaningful. Uh, but the fact that you're talking about a blue rose case, which is sort of, you know, that's the the hunt for you know mysteries. Those are the most mysterious of the mysteries, the the X-Files before the fact. You know? Yeah, a blue rose case where you're investigating something that leads you to a, a red room. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's that is Lynch up, down, and all over. I have talked to the uh, Spark 121 people and I sent a recording to Twin Peaks Unwrapped uh, talking about my idea about what these, uh, you know, what we're essentially dealing here are transdimensional beings that uh, are communicating with us uh, through symbols born uh, out of trauma. Um, or th that's how it's manifesting. It's it's like they're collecting things, and the and the symbol that you know that whether it's the creamed corn, or or the the way that Bob appears is consistent 
uh, it me- means that it's a, it's objectively locked in because people are seeing these, you know, like Bob is has been seen as he is, as he appears to the viewer by multiple people. Well, they're they're building a dialect. Uh, you know, uh, it's like a it's a it's a communication. It's either a communication device, and who knows if they're actually doing it intentionally. But I call it a cross section of communication because if these are trans dimensional beings that are seeing con- causality as one whole, uh, you know, they're they're kind of existing outside of time, looking in on it. Uh, it would it would mean that they would have a fundamentally completely different understanding. Uh, you know, uh, of reality, which would explain yeah. why the hell they're so freaking weird. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it, it, and uh, and that's why I, what I think the backwards forwards dialect uh, represents is is that it's it's both at the same time. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and 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 of course the the little man or the, you know the man from the other place says to Cooper, "Is this future? Is this past?" In in Firewalk with Me, and uh, one of the clear. Uh, until this book, anyway, uh, moments of time travel, or at least projection into the past, of course, is Annie sending a message to Laura, which means that she had some sort of access to Laura's, uh, you know, she didn't know Laura, presumably, so uh, she had access somehow through the the doppelganger or the, the version of Laura that's trapped in the lodge. So on page 237 of the book, we have a photograph of a shelf on the bookhouse, uh, you know, that the Bookhouse Boys' favorite books, at least the characters, you know, that we that we know for the most part. Um, and there's some funny ones. There's the fact that James' favorite book is Charlotte's Web because he never was much of a reader, you know. But um, but Aaron Mento on the Twin Peaks Unwrapped podcast was talking about how he had discovered that if you take words from the book's titles, it creates fear the double. For all the books that are labeled with a symbol that can be reversed in a mirror and appear the same. Yes. So 1, 8, and 11. 11. The double I, which, you know, again. Yeah, yes. the double I. Yeah. Um, so that would be Hawk's favorite book, being Fear and Loathing on the Campaign Trail, 72, by Hunter S. Thompson. Mm-hmm. 8, mm-hmm. the Warren Commission Report, the official report of the President's Commission on the Assassinated President John F. Kennedy, which is Cooper's, Cooper's favorite book. Mm-hmm. The 11 or double I, which is Hank's favorite book, which is Double Indemnity. Yes. Um, you take the first word from each of those titles, and you get Fear the Double. And you take away everything that's an I, because the I is weird. You're left with just eight being not reversible. And that's Cooper's book, Fear the Double Cooper. Now you pointed out something. You, you were talking about you know, why would it need to be encoded in into the document if uh, Briggs, right there on the last page, says there's something wrong with Cooper. Yeah, there's that. I really feel that the key book on this book stand is The Stand by Stephen King, simply because it's by Stephen King, and the archivist's note is on page two thirty seven, which has an interesting resonance for Stephen King fans who watch Stanley Kubrick's The Shining where there's a major change in the room numbers between the haunted hotel room in the movie and the book version. So I believe that that's saying something about difference between books and movies. Between a book and a television show perhaps. Yeah, that's uh, an interesting point. Yeah, because the yeah in the movie it's two three seven, and I think in the book it's two seventeen or something like that. Uh, I can't remember why they changed it. So let's let's talk about giants. Yes, let's talk about giants. Now you uh, you did quite a bit of research, and you sent me some of the research, and I only had time to read a little bit of it. So uh, you take the lead on that, and we'll have a discussion. Okay, I did do quite a bit of research on giants, and especially giants in North America. If you consider quite a bit of research to be falling asleep to a bunch of conspiracy podcasts for the last week. Yeah, so uh, you sent one, and I started listening to it, and it looked quite interesting. Um, And it had to do with the Smithsonian cover-up of pre-Columbian civilizations, right? Doing a little bit of research on giants in North America, 
I was able to determine that there are a number of at least conspiracy theories going far back into the 19th century that indicate that giant skeletons have been found in various different places, especially within some of the mounds that were built by pre-Columbian civilizations. And a big conspiracy is that those skeletons have been claimed by and hidden by the Smithsonian Institute for unknown reasons. At the bottom of page 33, the archivist makes mention of a number of rumors and oddities that President Jefferson may have secretly sent Lewis to investigate. A particular interest to Twin Peaks fans would be the final possibility. A mysterious race of giants. Further explicated in the footnote, number 15, Agent T. P. notes that there are dozens of 19th and early 20th century newspaper stories from across the country detailing the discovery of various giant skeletons, usually seven to nine feet tall, most often from ancient burial mounds. These are believed to predate any previously known North American civilization. Curiously, in most instances the bones were apparently collected by the Smithsonian Institution and never seen again. Um, that is all true-ish. It has the hint of, or perhaps the aroma of truthiness, um, because there are a number of 19th century newspaper reports of giant skeletons being found. And there are a large number of conspiracy theories about why those might have been covered up. Everything ranging from their aliens to they're the biblical Nephilim and prove that the earth is only 6,019 years old and that the Bible is true and that evolution is false. Now, frankly, seen as there is a scientific explanation for these giants, I mean, they're unusual, some of them being almost nine feet tall, but there are recorded people with um, pituitary gigantism that are seven and eight feet tall. And... It could very well be that in a civilization that was not bound to a computer and sitting for eight hours a day as your method of survival, being nine feet tall and built like Andre the Giant might make your survival options a lot better, which means you would go up in the civilization's hierarchy, which means that you would probably have your choice of um, mates to choose from, which means that you could choose another pituitary giant which means that the recessive gene would be more likely to be passed along, etc., etc., etc. This happens a couple of times, and after a few generations, people are worshipping the people who are essentially giants. That becomes part of the culture, and that just feeds on itself until the culture, for whatever reason, falls apart. So, seeing as there's a scientific explanation for it, frankly, I don't understand why the Smithsonian Institution would spend the time, money, and risk to keep it all secret. Except if they were being controlled by another organization that has another reason for covering up the existence of those giants. Yeah. To kind of like even bring it back a little bit further into the Twin Peaks realm, obviously there's a giant in the series. And it does go a little ways into sort of like a offering at least an ex explanation or the possibility of an explanation as to why there's a giant. You, you know, the the production of it is that, that Lynch just sort of like suddenly inserted a giant at some point. Like they basically wrote it in on his as a whim. Uh, a stroke of genius where he suddenly said, you know what this scene needs? <laughs> just Get a, me a giant. You have the uh, the map, you know, the map from Owl Cave uh, has the has a giant and a little man, um, you know. So the, and there's probably you know, you know like mythological reasons, you know, for their presence. Well, yeah, I mean, there's giants have been in mythology for pretty much as long as there's been mythology, as far as we can tell. Yeah, but uh, you know, it's it's interesting because we know that that Carol Stroiken is back for as the giant, but we don't have. Uh, the little man, you know, the man from another place. We don't have, uh, um, I think he might be the only, well, no, there, he's not the only lodge guy, uh, but we, uh, the, you'd have to go to fire walk with me. I, I guess the guy that plays the jumping man is in there too, um, which is interesting. Uh, mm. uh, you know, he had like a long nosed mask and he was in the kind of in the corner. Kind of the weird plague doctor dude. Yeah. Yeah. 
Giants are weird, also cool, and they're in Twin Peaks. <laughs> Conclusion, zero. <laughs> <laughs> so half the damn book's about aliens, right? Right. Um, frankly, so much ink has been spilled on aliens that I kind of just let that wash over me. And I kind of just grinned and replayed old X Files episodes in my head. Yeah. Um, because there's, other than the fact that frickin' Nixon is supposed to be <laughs> our anti alien savior, uh, there wasn't a whole lot of new stuff there, but there was a whole lot of kind of comfort food. Mm -hmm. Because there are. Were interesting tie into Twin Peaks using Project Blue Book documents and all that. Mm -hmm. But the actual alien tie ins were kind of. They weren't something that I really looked at strongly at first. What caught me strongly was basically giants are cool and mm -hmm. this typography is weird. Yeah, and well, one thing about the uh, the alien element uh, is that, that you know. I think in a couple of the interviews that I've come across with Frost is that he is very, uh, I guess coy would be one word for it, but he says that we have to, you know, be kind of careful what you say when you talk about aliens, you know, it's like, you know, because we're not, you know, alien to us maybe, but we're not necessarily talking about aliens from outer space. Although, you know, this does get into the Roswell, the Greys and all that kind of stuff. But somebody posted today on, on Twitter, an old inquirer, I guess, of Jackie Gleason talking about, how he has been in a bunker and has seen the alien. <laughs> um, so that apparently came from an actual tabloid. Now, he's not named specifically in the book, but uh, the the celebrity that accompanies Douglas Milford and uh, and Nixon into this bunker is uh, almost certainly Jackie Gleason. Right, and you know during the sixties, um, especially UFOs, flying saucers, that was a huge societal thing. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, the 60s was when, like, the first saucer cults got formed, like the Raelians. Mm -hmm. It's when uh, Chariots of the Gods came out. The book that sold six million copies by pretending to be archaeology that was written by a Dutch guy while he was in jail for fraud. Mm -hmm. it, it became a huge thing. So, yeah, lots of people were interested in saucers. And there's two hack writers that show up in this book, one of whom is uh, Shaver. Mm -hmm. And the other one is L. Ron Hubbard. And possibly Ray Palmer as well. Mm. Um, he was more of a hack publisher. But, um... uh, but of course, the one, thre the one major thread that goes all the way through the book is the ring. The, uh, mm. the jade. It's called jade, but who knows what it's actually made out of. Um, uh, the jade ring, which I, I don't have a kind of an encyclopedic knowledge of the whole chronology of the ring. But what's interesting to me... You know, you have these different figures that are, uh, Frost uses the word worrying a lot there. You know, it's like, it's almost like Lord of the Rings, you know, where they, they kind of have it as this totemic thing that they're, you know, uh, holding on to. But I kind of wonder if there is a single ring. Because, you know, it's like, uh, I, I think, uh, you know, Joel and the guys on Twin Peaks on Raft were talking about how, you know, it's interesting that the, that the you know, you think of Richard Nixon wearing this ring, you know, decades before Teresa Banks. And I kind of wonder if there is a single ring or if it's something that just sort of manifests itself when it needs to, because it's the only thing that kind of comes out of the lodge, right? Everything else is sort of like there's a, you have possessing spirits and things like that, but like a, the only physical object that seems to ever come out of the lodge. Yeah, if it actually comes out of the lodge, that's an interesting kettle of fish. We know that Meriwether Lewis encountered something. He had some kind of mystical experience in the geographical location that would become Twin Peaks. We don't know what that was. We don't know how he got out of it. We don't know if it cursed him or blessed him. Maybe both. What we do know is that people who are shown wearing that ring uh, usually have short and tumultuous lives. In Nixon's case, his life was actually quite long, but his political life ended pretty darn quick after he was spotted wearing the ring. Yeah, and uh, it it just kind of makes me think like the way that you see it in Fire Walk with Me is that it kind of it manifests like it, it shows up in Laura's hand after the dream, 
you know. But mm -hmm. and in the future, the last point that we see it is the nurse, ta and this is in the missing pieces. The nurse takes it off of Annie's comatose body. Uh, but it, we have uh, uh, Philip Gerard as you know, like as Mike, you know, uh, drives up to Laura and uh, and Leland in the car, and he, you know, and he's like freaking out, and he has it on his pinky. And he's screaming at her that it's your father. It's showing up. It's be, it's being you know. It's like this charged symbol. But I'm just kind of wondering, like, if you could actually trace this one ring through all of these different contexts, or if it's something that you know that is manifested out of the lodge. All I'm saying is, is I wonder if that's if that ring was actually worn by L. Ron Hubbard, Meriwether Lewis, and Richard Nixon, or if they if it's uh, multiple. Well, it could be multiple rings because it could be an indicator of membership in a society. A membership oh, yeah. in the lodge in you know three or four different senses of the word because this is a lynch film mm -hmm. and the last film the last major film that lynch did before fire walk with me and he was doing during the production of twin peaks was uh wild at heart and there are rings all over wild at heart uh i just did a recent rewatch of that it's the first one in many years um i'm going to be writing a a paper on it and Rings with symbols, uh, big class rings, big, you know, like society membership, you know, they just like those big clunky rings uh, appear in several scenes, you know, to the point where it's like you got to think that it was something it was kind of an image that he was really uh, enjoying playing with. Mm. Uh, and so that, you know, and that's something that didn't really factor as far as we know into the series. I mean, that Douglas Milford has a ring on his finger when after he's, you know, found dead. It doesn't look like it's the actual owl ring because as as far as we know the owl ring was something that was introduced into the twin peaks mythos canon in fire walk with me yeah it was not on teresa's finger that was the thing you know, there was a blank spot so they kind of say you know where's you know where's the ring uh and then agent desmond finds it on a mound of dirt underneath the the chalfont um or teresa's old uh trailer Mm -hmm. And it's on a mound of dirt that's very similar to the mound of dirt in the train car. And I think that loosely piled dirt is something that does show up a little bit in Lynch's work. It shows up in Eraserhead. Uh, Henry has a drawer full of dirt. You know, it's this kind of thread that you can kind of trace throughout uh, some of Lynch's work. But it is interesting. Here we have a case where Frost is picking up on something that was a pure Lynch creation and running with that imagery. Yeah. Carl Rod makes an appearance, which is cool. Yeah. Uh, the, uh... Yeah, I noticed that. Mm -hmm. um, there's also the matter of the massive contradictions on Dr. Jacoby's brother. Um, he seems to be something that if all of the details in the dossier are true, he's like the product of three different timelines. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting that it's Jacoby's brother, except uh, uh, Jacoby's brother seemed to be a little bit more conventional than... Uh... Than the doctor. Yeah, um, which is another kind of example of doubling and reversal. Mm -hmm. But I don't. I I need to read the book again. Mm -hmm. Well, I've said everything that I've noticed about the book. Okay. Um, so I wanted to take extra care. Uh, I know that there's a lot of Twin Peaks podcasts out there, and uh, after the announcement in, in what was it in October of 2014, I had some ideas about jumping in on the Twin Peaks podcast bandwagon. But I saw that there were actually were a number of podcasts that were out there before the announcement, and they have just kind of blown up since then. And that's why, even though this isn't going to necessarily be a strict Twin Peaks podcast, uh, I wanted to talk about the community a little bit because it's it's just blown up. It's um, it's made it uh, really enjoyable to revisit the series as we build our anticipation for the new uh, season. And I just wanted us to give a shout out to a few here. You and I have corresponded with uh, Stephen M of Sparkwood Twenty One. Yeah, and they're great. Yeah, uh, they they were kind of like before. Um, they kind of you know got their start in uh, November of uh, 2014, and Steve and Emma have produced a wonderful podcast with some of the best recaps and episode commentary out there. They really made a lot of strides building this community as they included listener feedback from fans like Joel Bacco and John Bernardi and you and I, which really made it into a conversation. Earlier this year, I had the pleasure of being a part of a series of interviews that they conducted, making it more of a literal conversation. 
Sparkwood and 21 is on a bit of a hiatus, but they do shows on other series like Ash vs. the Evil Dead and Vikings as a part of their No Ship network. Uh, check out their site at noship.net. Uh, another great one is uh, Twin Peaks Unwrapped. The, uh, ben and Brian have released 74 episodes since the middle of last year, making them one of the most reliable and prolific Twin Peaks podcasts. For me, this was one of the best veteran plus a newbie podcasts, and it was great fun listening to Brian become more enthusiastic and invested in the series as he went along. Once they had gotten over the series, film, and supplemental material, they changed formats and are now a valuable hub for interviews with producers and creators like Harley Payton and Mark Frost himself, John Thorne, co-creator of Wrapped in Plastic magazine, and more. I always look forward to each week's episode. Uh, and you've been listening to them as well, haven't you? Like, uh... I- I've been listening to them for the last few weeks. I haven't mm-hmm. had a chance to go back and listen to their back catalog, but mm-hmm. I'm looking forward to doing so because they are great. Yeah. Kind of a more recent podcast, but has quickly become ju- just among the best, is, uh, is the Diane podcast out of Brighton, England. Uh, it is a relative new- newcomer, as I said, but they, they hit with a massive splash as Rosie, Mark, Adam, and Bob conduct philosophically rich analyses of each episode. Uh, recently, they've waded into the famously questionable middle period of the second season, and they still seem to be having no trouble at all finding plenty of grist for the intellectual mill. Mythology, fairy tales, cosmic horror, and tarot archetypes are all lenses through which the hosts view Twin Peaks, and it never ceases to be fascinating. That, uh, that's one that uh, you've picked up recently as well, right? Yeah, I've listened to all of it twice because uh, it's a really smart, well-done podcast, and I love the English accents. <laughs> yeah, uh, Twin Peaks Revival is one that I've discovered more recently. Uh, they, they, I don't think you've heard them, but uh, their irreverent humor and occasional silliness. Uh, it might be easy to underestimate this podcast, but Brian and Chris tackle the series with surprising rigorousness. Uh, if you listen to each re- episode for the recap and hilarious discussion, be sure to check out their WordPress site uh, for the bonus videos, which are stunning. This is where they delve into the minutia of shot analysis, observations about props, and other details that are easy to miss. Dear Meadow Radio, uh, Mark is really uh, killing it on that podcast. It's it's an individual, even though he has conducted some interviews, by virtue of being only one host, Dear Meadow Radio is not conversational, but it, it takes a form reminiscent of radio news, commentary, and uh, the, re- the release schedule is more infrequent than any many of the other podcasts, but the host, Mark, really delves into his topics with an approach that can only be described as audio documentary. He begins with a stunning three-part series just on the background of the show, beginning with uh, the background of its production, the collaborations between Mark Frost and David Lynch that precede the show, and historical content like the real murder that inspired the mystery at the heart of Twin Peaks. Later, he analyzes the plot, conducts interviews, and sets up for Mark Frost's secret history of Twin Peaks by breaking down the Twin Peaks Access Guide, which as a document has had a bit of a bad rap, but Mark does a great job teasing out all of the important information found therein. Have you listened to that that one at all? I have. And of all the people doing really good pick-and-shovel work out there, his picks have bit the deepest and delved the furthest. Yeah, he did, he did a uh, remarkable job. And uh, you know, I'm thinking that maybe if we keep with the, the Twin Peaks podcasts in the future, I'll, uh, I'll talk about more. But there's a lot out there, uh, obviously. There's a few in the, in the Spanish language, and I, it makes me really wish I spoke Spanish because uh, I, I'd kind of like to hear different cultural takes on it as well. But anyway, I just wanted to get that down because it really is about the community right now as we wait for the new series to start. It makes it a lot more fun. And, uh, you know, it shows that, gosh, there's uh, a thousand and one ways to kick a dead horse. No, it's, it's <laughs> <laughs> no, it is, uh, uh, th- this is a rich, you know, world, uh, and it's always worth diving into. So, um, anyway, with that, uh, I'm going to say good night, good luck, and, uh, hopefully we will be back soon with another edition. Thank you for listening to the Counter Esperanto podcast on the Pseudo Spaces Network. Please direct all email correspondence to Counter Esperanto at Pseudo Spaces. That's P S E U D O S P A C dot E S. Thank you.